Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today, we are talking about Matthew Hahn. It's a very interesting case. I'm here with my good friend, Stefan, and thank you for listening. Hey, everybody. Hey. So Matthew Hahn was raised in California in a two-parent middle-class home with a younger sibling, a sister. His parents were divorced in his early teen years, and his home was neither the best nor was it the worst. It would probably be best described as average in the truest sense of the word. There was no abuse, but there were always issues. Matt says he had a thing for resisting authority, something that a lot of people can seem to relate to. If he wasn't supposed to do it, whatever it was, that thing became more alluring. That was how he first came to try marijuana. He was in the 8th grade, middle school, when he was offered the opportunity to try it. He remembers thinking, hell yeah, I'm not supposed to do it, so I will. That would also be the year of his first arrest. He turned up at a school dance under the influence, and the school reported him to the cops. He was smoking pot regularly by then. Matt would try just about anything that was put in front of him for just about the same reasons. By his junior year in high school, he had tried many drugs, but he wasn't an addict. It was more of a social thing, something he would do at parties, and, uh, you know, as teens do when they get together, they uh, sometimes use drugs. And then over the summer prior to his senior year, Matt contracted mono, the kissing disease. This would cause him to miss his first semester of his senior year. When he returned to high school, he was expected to complete all of his assignments that he had missed during his absence, as well as keeping up with the normal course load going forward. Matt could not conceive how he would accomplish what seemed, at least to him, an impossible task. And in his desperate 17-year-old mind, he hit upon a solution. And well, to be fair, like most great plans, he had a partner in crime, his best friend, Alex. That's like me and Stefan. Yes, that's definitely, if we were, oh God, the trouble we would get into with a little bit of meth. Um, but Matt and Alex decide that they would score some meth so that they could use the hours normally occupied with sleeping to basically get all of his schoolwork done that he had missed prior to his absence. Yeah, and that's not, I mean, I've heard of that happening a bunch. You know, I mean, just in high school, kids yeah. are taking uh, Adderall like crazy. It's not meth, but it's an amphetamine. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty common. So at the time, and probably still now, crystal meth was relatively inexpensive and plentiful in Matt's California neighborhood. And it's very, very potent and much more so than anything else he had been doing. And compared to marijuana, which high typically lasts for, you know, a couple hours, users are stuck with a meth high for 24 hours. And it doesn't take much to get a novice high because no one sells meth in such minuscule amounts. When you feel yourself starting to come down, you still have some left. So you take another bump and you're off again for another day or so. In this manner, someone like Matt, who wasn't used to something so strong, could stay high for a week on not very much money. Matt and Alex cruised along in this manner for several months. And at night, while the rest of the world slept, they would go up into the forest to talk and smoke because that's what it makes you do. But they would soon learn that coming down is another story. See, crystal meth didn't exist during Einstein's time, but his for every action is an equal and opposite reaction principle, it holds true. As high as the highs are, the lows of coming down are in equal proportion. Think Dante's ninth circle of hell. Symptoms include crushing amounts of hopelessness, a black depression, muscle pains, anxiety, insomnia despite total fatigue, and migraine-level headaches, plus more. Think of the misery of your worst hangover, then amplify it to the power of 10 and you might be getting close. It sounds like a typical night in uh, Stefan's life on a Friday. Agreed. Stop putting me on blast for these people, Kenny. But this is what crystal meth seems to do to people. Matt dropped out of school after six weeks of continual meth use. He was hooked, an addict. His mother, now a single parent and his primary caretaker uh, for him and his sister, couldn't control his meth-fueled rages that would rock their home at the slightest provocation, or no provocation at all. Looking back, Matt admits that he was starting to like the feelings of power and control that came in the wake of these outbursts. Matt was definitely changing, or at least the meth was changing him. Over time, he would replace his lifelong friends with drug buddies. His younger sister began to be afraid of him, and he was ordered out of the family home. He would sometimes even break into the garage just to grab a few hours of sleep without being bothered. And he didn't need much sleep. 
Within six months, Matt started stealing to support his addiction. He set strict rules for himself, though. He would only steal from businesses or construction sites, no homes and no cars. But after a while, he began to give himself a little bit more permission to, you know, go into the occasional open garage and steal a bicycle, um, you know, as uh, meth head morals yeah. seem to work. He know? started breaking his own rule about not stealing from people. So, yeah, as he would revise his rules, he would begin to not hit houses, but garages and cars were okay. Until the time came when an interior door in the garage was left open to reveal some expensive tools. It was just a few feet inside the home. He could practically reach them while still standing in the garage. His drug dealer was a tool nut and would trade for them well. His self-limiting rules didn't stand a chance against full-blown meth addiction. It wasn't long before the only rule was to not hit homes while they were occupied. And of course, that was due more for self-preservation than any moral compulsion. In 1999, when he was only 18 years old, Matt was caught burglarizing a garage and prosecuted for numerous felonies when the investigation turned up additional stolen property. Facing a potential 40-year prison sentence, he agreed to a plea deal in which he would serve three years in prison and a few years of probation following his release. He also agreed to having three strikes on his record, even though this was his first adult arrest. At the time, California had the toughest three-strike laws in the United States. This legislation would allow numerous strikes to be levied on a single arrest, although the state could not strike you out on a single arrest. While it has since been revised in the early aughts, it meant that anyone who had three strikes on the record who committed another strikeable offense would be facing life in prison. No questions asked, no leniency shown. Matt served his sentence at Folsom Prison and went back to his life. Unfortunately, he picked up right where he left off, including the drugs, burglaries, all of it. Yeah, so, you know, after he got out of prison, he goes right back to what he was doing uh, before. And he has three strikes now, technically. So all he has to do is mess up one more time and he could go away for life. Yeah, yeah. Life becomes very dangerous at that point if you're, you know, still doing drugs. I mean, you're gambling your life away, essentially, you know, if you break parole in any way. Yep. So Matt really wanted an ATV, specifically a three-wheeled one. But these three-wheel ATVs are prohibited by law in California from either being sold or manufactured due to the high risk of injury or death from rollover accidents caused, you know, by their high center of gravity and only three wheels. And this thought became a burning desire once he learned that it was forbidden. Matt learned of a house in the area that supposedly had two of these ATVs for the taking. So now... He's just stealing because he wants it. But So in the middle of the night, one night, Matt loaded up a borrowed van with a few motorcycle ramps to load the machines and took along a drug buddy with whom he had committed uh, different breaking and enterings before. They parked a good distance from the house, and they would scope out the property first to see if anyone was home and to locate the ATVs. They were about ready to give up when Matt got a funny feeling. Called intuition, but Matt believes that these gut feelings are the result of his subconscious picking up upon things that have not registered in the conscious mind. Matt decided that regardless, they should leave, so he turned to look for his accomplice, who had wandered a short distance away. He saw that the back door of the house, which had been closed on his first pass by, was now standing open. Remember, Matt is a three-strike felon. If he is caught trying to burgle the residence or found with burglary tools or drugs on his person, he's facing life. Matt could not see his partner, but through that open door, he could see into the bedroom. In the middle of the bedroom floor stood a safe. Matt wanted that safe. And in that moment, his buddy appeared and they decided to grab the safe and hightail it out of there. They managed to lift up the safe and calling on their meth field super strength, manhandled it into the van. And they went away. They got away. Now, this safe was a particularly good one. It was a solid Liberty brand made entirely of cast iron, and neither young men had any experience cracking the safes, and they would have to basically rely on brute force. But seeing as it was the middle of the night, Matt told his colleague that they would have to wait until morning or they would uh, basically wake the entire neighborhood grinding this thing open. His partner said he didn't want to wait around and asked Matt to call him in the morning when he deemed it safe to begin. 
This delighted Matt, of course, because he thought, you know, if he was alone opening up the safe by himself, he would maybe get a bigger cut of some cash that he found inside. And uh, that's exactly what he did. He, you know, spent a couple hours of intense labor trying to force open this safe, and uh, eventually he did. So when he opens it, he says he reaches his hand in and he feels something really soft and squishy. And this totally baffled him. He had no idea what he was about to pull out of this safe. As he reaches out, looks at his hand, he sees it's a diaper. And a soiled diaper at that. Matt's drug-addled brain couldn't conceive of a reason to keep such an object in a safe. Matt thought maybe they used the diaper to conceal gemstones of some sort, and he talks about him ripping open these diapers, uh, but to no avail, they were just poopy diapers. Which is really bizarre. With no gems. Can you imagine such a thing? So Matt reached into the back of the safe and withdrew several more diapers, some clean and some soiled, and also hidden in the safe was a 22 caliber handgun, adoption paperwork for an adult male, supposedly the safe's owner, and a single USB thumb drive. That was it. The sum total of the safe's contents. As a convicted felon, Matt was prevented from even pawning the gun, the only item with some value, and of course, to him, this was extremely disappointing. He called his partner in crime with the news, cracked a beer, and sat down to wait for his arrival. Out of curiosity, Matt popped the USB drive into his computer tower to see if maybe, just maybe, the memory stick would feature anything that could be converted into ready cash. Like, I don't know, bank account numbers, uh, pin numbers, anything like that. So Matt scrolled through the thumbnail images that were on the USB drive, And it was, you know, a vacation at the beach, photos of a car accident, probably for insurance. And the rest appeared to be some guy's homemade amateur porn. So the whole venture really was a total bust. But before closing the program, one of the thumbnail images caught his eye. Something felt wrong about it, but not in the way he could readily define. Until his subconscious made the connection for him. The photos were indeed someone's homemade porn collection, but the woman depicted in the photos was no woman. It was a very young child, three years old at most. The very last photo showed what looked to be an unmarked grave. It was located in the back garden of a home and clearly showed an oblong area of soil that had been recently turned and slightly mounded. Matt knew he had to do something, but what? He was a three-strike felon. If the authorities learned that he had burgled a home, he would receive a life sentence in prison. But he knew that he had to do something. Now, I want you to ask yourself, what would you do in this situation? Would you willingly volunteer a life sentence in prison for the sake of an unknown child? Perhaps a child who is no longer even alive? Well, that's exactly what Matthew Hunt did in 2005. And he is a hero for it. Matthew didn't want to go to prison, obviously, and he tried to make law enforcement aware of these images anonymously. Matthew drove around until he located a home that was clearly occupied by a family. He then returned in the middle of the night. After wiping the USB stick clean of his fingerprints, he then placed it in an envelope in their mailbox. Written on the outside of the envelope was, quote, 911 graphic photos enclosed. Turn over to Las Gradas Police Department. Inside, he included a typed letter for the police. Quote, I stole this from... Address of the home. They belong to Robbie Aitkins. I don't want anything to do with this because I stole it. Please remove this animal from the streets. The name Robbie Aitkins had been on the adoption paperwork in the safe, and Matthew presumed it all belonged to him. He presumed correctly. So John Robertson Aitkins, who went by Robbie, was a 22-year-old with no criminal record. The child in the photos was his goddaughter, and also his employer's child. He had been awakened on the night of the burglary to find his gun safe missing, and he reported the theft to police. When police received the memory card, they knew they had to act quickly. A very young child was in very grave danger. So they called Aikens and asked him to come down to the station to answer some follow-up questions regarding the theft of his gun safe. At least that's what they told him. 
Once there, investigators pulled out a folder and set down a photo in front of Aitkins. It wasn't a graphic image, only a blown up photo of his face. But Aitkins knew if they had this photo, that they had all the photos. Aitkins seemed to melt into his chair, and he placed his hands over his face, deeply inhaled, and began to talk. Quote, It was just, it's stupid, you know. It was one day being stupid. And, you know, did it. Halfway through it, I was so upset with myself, you know, stopped and said, what am I doing? And stopped, spent the next week throwing up, all upset about it, thinking, how could I do this to someone I love? End quote. And again, of course, that was what he said to the police. Aitkins was employed by the parents of the toddler in their family computer business. He had become so close with the family, he was almost like a son to them. He traveled with the family on vacation, he babysat their cherished first child, and they made him her godfather. They were so close. Robbie sometimes slept in the same bed with the child. Searches of his home turned up one of the little girl's dresses hidden in a closet. A computer forensic search uncovered thousands of the types of images that were found in the safe. According to court documents, the child's mother went to the correctional facility where Aitkins was being held, and she had two questions for him. The first was, was I there when it happened? No, he replied. Did you sell the photographs? No, he said. She just got up and left. Matthew Hahn would be faced with a choice that for him would be no really choice at all. Reveal his identity and face prosecution for numerous felonies, resulting in a significant prison sentence for himself, or keep quiet and take the chance of Aitkins walking free. The prosecutor would have to demonstrate the chain of custody of that USB drive to prove police did nothing inappropriate to have possession of it, or it wouldn't be admitted into the trial as evidence. And that USB drive was really the only evidence they had, other than Aitken's subsequent confession. California, like many other states, requires additional evidence to support a suspect's confession. If his confession were the only evidence, they would need to drop the charges and turn Aitken's loose. Yeah, in the very least, their case just wouldn't be anywhere near as strong. So this was the choice facing Matthew Hahn. Despite many of his flaws and failings, Matthew took it on the chin and agreed to testify against his own attorney's advice. He got on the stand and admitted under oath to stealing the safe. Which is just, God, I mean, it's, again, you have to do this, right? Yeah, and taking it on the chin, I feel like, is really an understatement. This guy put his life and freedom on the line. Yep. Which, you know, is is just so commendable. Yeah, so Aikens was convicted and found guilty of the sexual abuse of a child under 14 along with a host of related charges. Matthew Hahn was also facing prosecution for the burglary of the safe, which would result in the sentence of over 400 years, up to natural life, of course, in prison. Matthew was actually facing exponentially more time than Aikens received. Immediately after Aikens' trial, the case received some local publicity and some people were outraged at the apparent injustice of the situation. Enough people contacted the prosecutor's office that they offered Matthew a plea deal that allowed him to serve 14 years instead of something like hundreds of years. And of course, he took the deal. Matthew Hahn has since served his time and has been released. Today, he's married with a young child of his own, and he remains clean and sober. And he now says he has a pretty great life. He goes to his high school alma mater every year to speak with the students about his case. The students don't know he's actually in the room when they arrive, and they are given the case facts and put into groups to debate the issues. Some think obviously he's scum and he deserved to be sentenced, and others, uh, kids who have had, you know, some type of experience with addiction, believe he was wronged. This case demonstrates that no matter our personal demons and struggles with addiction, Um, you know, that doesn't define you necessarily, and everyone's sort of capable of being good, or at least a shade of good and evil. And, you know, we're not defined by our failures and our misdeeds, and perhaps, you know, some of us can find redemption along the way. Matthew Hahn certainly has. Long live Matthew Hahn. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
you know, this is something that really goes to show, you know, you could be addicted to drugs, you can do bad things in the name of addiction. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person, you know? And I, there's a ton, I mean, tons and tons and tons of people, no matter what they say, a lot of people wouldn't have done what he did. A lot of people would not have went back to prison to testify against this guy. Yeah, it was a sacrifice. He really did. He made a huge sacrifice, and I'm so glad that it ended up working out for him and people were able to make a stink and get him out. Yep. Um, or at least, yeah, get him with... Uh, it sucks because it's like 14 years is still a ton for something like this, but at least it's not a life sentence. So. Yeah, 400 years is insane. And yeah. and yeah, like you said, he was potentially going to get more time than the guy who's doing terrible, unspeakable acts. It's yeah. Also, we didn't mention this, but at different times, or at least once during this whole thing, Matthew Hahn was in the same jail uh, as Aitkins. But because Aitkins, because of the crimes he committed, he was put into pr uh, protected custody. Um, that's just what happens, uh, you know, with people that are serving that sort of, uh, you know, conviction. Crazy. That's so crazy. You would think that that would be like some sort of conflict of interest or something, yeah, but I knows? guess they weren't really uh, able to like talk to each other or anything like yeah, that. They were like separated, that. but oh man. All right, guys, thanks for listening to this crazy episode. We will see you uh, next week. Be excellent to each other. Tell your stepmoms. Tell your stepmoms and stepdads. Later. <laughs>